Welcome to um, another session. I am um, I am going to touch on a topic today that I believe will be um, somewhat sensitive, um, but a topic that I believe is worth having um, nonetheless, and one that I hope will begin a conversation. Firstly, hopefully, and hopefully. Um, an introspection on whether my observations are correct and something that might lead to a conversation uh, respectively in our lives and hopefully collectively as a, as a group and something I hope will be fed back to me whether you agree, disagree um, or are indifferent. I'm going to talk about uh, the crisis within young boys and particularly uh, within uh, young men uh, and it's a, it's a self-image uh, crisis. I'll share a, a story, my experience, and then I'll connect it to uh, perhaps a, a few examples that I believe anyone listening to me can relate to and then I'll provide perhaps a, uh, a way forward. Let me start with what I think the problem and where the, orig the origin of the problem began. Um, and really this starts way back with the feminist movement. Now, don't think this is another um, session where a man gets to attack feminism and the feminist movement, no. What I'd like to talk about is one of the unintended consequences of the feminist doctrine and how that has had an effect on young men today and young uh, boys. But if you go back to the 1960s and pre the 1960s, um, the feminist movement has started. Um, and in many ways, they were fighting for a good cause. But I'm sure you've heard uh, that even a broken clock is right twice every day. Um, there were things that were not taken into careful consideration. Um, and one of those things was the depiction of men um, as a group across society. Now that negative depiction in many ways found its way into media. And since the 1960s, there's been a, a huge assault, especially in the, in the developed West, on the male image. Irrespective of ethnicity, there has been a huge um, attack on the male image. Now let's put that to us to one side and let me perhaps share uh, an experience I had. And I can say this uh, in all honesty that this series of conversations, confessions, and catechisms, uh, the seed for what we're doing today uh, was something that came to me on this particular uh, encounter. I, I was out socially uh, with the missus and uh, I, I made a number of observations. We were with the group. Um, there was another lady in question who is not based in the United Kingdom. She lives in another continent. Um, I think just to be able to clean up the conversation, I'll, I will exclude specificity just to keep things uh, rather um, incognito, uh, put it that way. Now, I knew before she came that she had someone who was um, very interested in her. And had, he had been making his feelings known and they had gone past um, the introduction phase and from his perspective it was a relationship and so when we met I asked um, how he was and I always usually observe people's initial reactions. Uh, the relationship was termed in her perspective as uh, nothing more than friends with benefits. 
Uh, but I can tell you from what I had heard um, before I met her, because the information had come through, because it was something that was shared uh, with her cl close friends who I knew. Uh, I would say this, that the man in question, in my opinion, in my opinion, um, was quite exceptional. I'd seen his pictures, very good looking, um, typical laid back, hard working, middle class, um, intelligent man, common sense, very grounded, but very, very loving. There were things he was doing that I said was probably a bit too much, but nonetheless, um, I found uh, his, um, my initial, the initial account of what I had been told about him to be incredibly uh, uh, significant is that someone quite special. Now, I asked her the question, you know, how is your relationship with him? And she dismissed this slightly and made reference to the fact that he was, uh, I guess, nothing more than uh, just the booty call. Now, I, if you've heard me speak about relationships, especially for women and for men, uh, I think you should keep things on the surface. Um, but you should be honest with each other. In any case, what struck me the most was um, she described all of his qualities. I mean, integrity, his character, hard working, from a good family, ambitious, supportive, adventurous, name it. He ticked all the boxes. And so I asked a question. I said, well, what's the problem? And her reply was, well, he doesn't make me laugh. He's not funny enough. And I said, okay. You know, um, and she said, well, that's very, very important uh, to me. Again, uh, I have no criticisms uh, about people's choices. In any case, let's park that. Um, a couple of days later, we met up again in a little group. And um, we were having a conversation. Now, there was a conversation that came up about another man that I knew, I had met. And she made a, a statement, which was a, a glancing statement, that her, 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 her idea of an ideal day would be spending the day with the second man, because he's very funny, he tells a lot of jokes, and um, that, you know, it makes her happy. Now, I have to say, uh, and this is not a criticism towards the second person, um, but this is a man who cannot, and who, for whatever health reasons, and mental health reasons, cannot, is not self-sufficient, hasn't achieved anything. Uh, in many ways, most men, irrespective of social class, would say uh, he's um, an underachiever by any standards. Uh, no vision, no plan no focus, um, effectively is needs to be um, looked after. Um, but this was this lady's, and this is an intelligent woman, this was her um, ideal date. Now, I have to admit, he was also very funny. He spent most of his time just telling jokes. Um, in my circle of friends, we, we call him someone who is not serious. Um, there is a time and place for everything. And my observation when, when I met him, and I met him on more than a number of occasions, was that, um, I guess you might call it people who, um, there's a reference we use, which is Peter Pan, just never grew up. And so I had this uh, contrast in my, in my thought process. Well, here you have a man who is caught in you and has all the qualities of a good man, someone who could be a good husband, a good father, uh, a good support system, or a good boyfriend. But he wasn't good enough because he couldn't make you laugh. He wasn't a joker. And here you had another man who was completely um, unreliable, um, hadn't achieved anything in life, had no plans for the future, uh, in many ways uh, couldn't support himself without assisted support, i.e. something similar to assisted living, but was very funny and told jokes. And this was what she felt was what she needed. Now I'm referring to a woman who 
is not 20 or 30, I'm referring to a woman who's above 30 years old. So we're not talking about a young girl who um, is not quite sure about what she wants. In any case, uh, let's fast forward. Uh, we met up with some friends and for some reason I found myself amongst, um, uh, I was in amongst four people. I was one of the four, I should say, uh, two ladies. The girl in question was one of them. Uh, there was another girl and there was a gay guy. And as we spoke, uh, I made a number of observations. Um, it kept going back to the whole thing about, well, men say a bit too serious. Um, and, oh, this is too serious. I wish you just take life easy. And it came back to feelings. Um, and it, I didn't, the observation I made at the time was striking. But I usually let things pass through and I sleep over that. And then I make a, I try and, you know, connect the dots. But a lot of the conversation um, was more of a girly talk, no, no doubt. Um, whilst there was another man there in temperament, he was emotionally more feminine, um, being someone who was gay. And he felt, as you would imagine, he felt more connected to the other two ladies, uh, to them than he did to me, because he was more of a, I, I wear a masculine demeanor, and he wears, um, he wore a feminine demeanor. In any case, um, we let that pass. Uh, a couple of days later on, I, I had connected all the dots and then it dawned on me. And so I sat down with my friend and I said, um, you know, I've never felt more, more embarrassed for uh, the good, honest men out there who work hard every day just to to keep hunger at bay, to stay in character um, and to do right, both by society and by their families. I never felt more embarrassed. And, and she said, why? And I said, and I connected and I explained, I said, listen, there's something strange here. Um, amongst the group where we were, amongst the women, uh, and these are Anglo-Saxon Western women, what kept coming up was men who were not serious, men who were uh, joking, don't take life seriously, and laid back and funny, and um, there was no reference to uh, men of character, men of vision, hardworking men, men who had actually achieved within the social hierarchy uh, a level of competence and were recognized by the group. Um, and I said to her, well, there, there was a lot of reference to um, men being too serious and the world being too serious and life is supposed to be, you know, lazy and everything goes. And then it dawned on me and, and I said to her, which is where I begin today's conversation with you. I said, part of the reason is because for over the last um, 60 years, there has been an assault on the male image. Now let me go back so you can understand how important this is and how it's not really a trivial accusation to make. For those of you who are in the baby boom generation or generation X, um, you are familiar with the, the Flintstones. Uh, and even those who are younger, you are familiar with the Flintstones. The Flintstones, which, came, which was aired about 1960s. Uh, Simpsons, which was aired about the 90, the end of the, probably 1990, 1989, the start of 1990. And then Family Guy, which I think was aired sometime in the 1990s. Now, this is all meant to be satires. Uh, and you might think, what does this have to do with today's conversation? Well, this is where I give you a homework assignment and a research task. What is the connecting thread across all three TV shows? The connecting thread is that there were very 
successful shows. And any young person who is either Generation Y or Gen Y, Gen X, or Millennial, or, or even those who are Gen Z, are familiar with the Flintstones, Simpsons, and Family Guy. And when you look at each of these sitcoms, what you find is a picture of a family in each scenario. But one thing is constant. The father is almost useless, unreliable, no good, cannot be depended on to look after his family. What do you see about the mothers? Intelligent, independent, is the one who holds the family together, makes all the important decisions. Um, when you look at the kids, in the case of the Flintstones, or particularly, let me use the Simpsons. In the case of the Simpsons, what you find is when you look at the children, the male offsprings mirror their fathers. The female offsprings mirror their mothers. The daughters are made to be the intelligent ones, the A students, the smart ones, uh, the reliable ones, the male children are meant to be the unreliable ones, just like father, useless, just like their fathers. And in Family Guy, you see something similar. Even you have a dog that is wiser than the father. And you might think, well, what does this have to do with us in 2020, the year of our Lord, 2022 rather? Well, uh, if you understand the concept of how the self-image works and how the mind works, that we have a subconscious mind and a conscious mind. And if from a young age you've been watching any of these, these shows or even any of the Disney films and the Disney movies and um, any successful movie, there is always an underlying philosophy. For the last 60 years, through the media, we've been told men are not reliable, men are useless, cannot depend on men, but we've been also been shown that women are intelligent, dependable, or reliable, and so there goes the father, there goes the son, there goes the mother, there goes the daughters. And I said to uh, my friend, now I understand why the other girl in question and your friends kept referring back to wanting someone who is funny. Because we've been educated to think that all men are good for is how they make you feel. Whether that be a feeling through sex, a feeling through uh, resources, or a feeling through how they make you laugh. And I said to her, isn't it a shame that we've subjugated men to the point whereby we now believe men should be comedians um, and comics and clowns, that our role is to make you feel good. And I said, um, if you go back to the 1940s and pre the 1940s, um, life was meant to be serious. Obviously we didn't have this abundance of wealth um, as we do in the West. We had a life expectancy of 40 years, 45 if you were lucky, pre the 1940s. People got married at 28. People got married at between 20 and 25, with the average being about 25. You had 15 years from when you got married, before your death. And life was meant to be serious. Um, and you can see this in the reality that if you go pre the 20th century, and you looked at any photograph of people back then, there was a seriousness to the pictures. They were not trying to be serious, but what they recognized was they were capturing a time in history following the advent of photography. They were capturing a moment in history and they recognized that it was important to honor that moment. 
not with smiles, not with showing your teeth and trying to show that you're happy, uh, not trying to be a joker with gestures, but to recognize that it was a moment in history and it was important to show honor to that moment. But in any case, what you found was a lot of the men and a lot of the women back then were serious. And so I said to the lady, I said, well, it's a shame because in society today, my observation of a lot of young boys, and this is something uh, that I have struggled with, especially over the last six months, um, whenever I meet young men, all they talk about is their feelings. I, I would say, how do you think about, what do you think about this? And they would say, I feel. And I'll stop them and say, well, stop. No, don't tell me how you feel. Tell me what you think. Two separate things. And in so many uh, scenarios, the young boys cannot and do not understand what it means to think. They can articulate very, very clearly how they feel. They cannot tell you what they think. And a lot of that can be attributed to the fact that since the 1960s, you've seen a, an increase in the divorce rates. You've seen a liberalization of our sexual mores and um, the death of the traditional family the raising of kids in single parent families and most young men have been raised by mothers. A third of the, the kids who are raised in the UK today are raised by single mothers and, and in the other third where you have two parents, um, the male in that family was raised by a feminist or womanist mother, where all he heard was the attack on the male image. The men are useless, men are good for nothing. Plus he had seen in the media all of these um, shows, movies, where men were either created as villains, thieves, drunks, unreliable, and women were called um, intelligent, dependable, could be trust, trusted and trustworthy. And in many cases, some of these young men started to hate the male image. Most of them had no fathers. And so there was a, um, a validation that fathers do not stay. And so most young men look to their mothers as their role models. And you've heard me say this before, that men, when we think, we think logically. Women run their logic through their emotions. Men run their logic through their reasoning faculty. We can think deductively and inductively, both genders, but men, it comes natural to us. So when you ask a man a question, he, he answers based on what he thinks. We set aside feelings because we recognize that feelings are temporary and sometimes uh, they're based on a, an experience, a conditioning before the experience or a conditioning during the experience or um, a conditioning post the experience. So we recognize that feelings change Emotions are simply a manifestation of how we uh, bring forth to life the feeling we have internally. Sad, mad, glad, disgust. And these are corner emotions that we try to categorize our emotions into. But when I grew up, I grew up um, and I was taught by someone who I consider to be an exceptional man. And Perhaps I'm going to speak to that. But I was raised to think and to think logically. And if you came up with an answer to something, not to assume that your perspective was correct. And in many ways, I was taught 
the way people learned how to debate. Um, most people today do not have that exposure. So whenever I deal with issues, whether social, economic, uh, I follow pretty much the empirical method, deductive reasoning method. And, and like a debate, as I was taught um, the art of debate, you were given a topic to, to, to learn, to, to study, but you were not told whether you would be arguing for or against. And therefore you had to prepare to argue both sides. And in many ways you did not understand the topic well enough, except you could argue both sides and therefore emotions were void in the analysis. It wasn't about how you felt. In any case, coming back to today's session, I observed that a lot of lots of young men today are going based on their feelings. And a lot of those feelings have been conditioned into them um, by their mothers or by their weak fathers. To the point whereby in society today, uh, the mating choice for women today is, is more about whether he can make you laugh. Is he funny? Um, is he, can he tell great jokes? Um, I'm yet to meet women who stop and say, well, I like a man who has a goal, uh, is driven, has a vision for what he wants in his life, can articulate that vision um, in a few words, has it in writing, is working and striving towards that goal, has integrity, is of good character, was raised in a good family, knows how to respect a woman, um, recognizes the role and the role he plays in society beyond just the family, um, is kind, is gentle, is loving, is funny. But recognize I began with what I consider to be much more important foundations to be in a responsible man. Now, you might think, okay, um, so where do we go from here? Now, I'll make some um, general statements and let me connect this to my father for, um, in, a, in a short while. But I am of the opinion that the damage that was done to the male image will take about three generations um, for us to erase those stereotypes um, to bring back men into what we've always been um, protectors providers men who could preach in other words who had the opportunity and the ability to communicate their vision to their kids and to society um, men who were kind men who could pray and men who could profess their love however they chose to now believe me i've, I've spoken about this with other women and let's just say that across the different groups, it pains me to say this, that men and all we are good for today can be put into three distinct groups. Number one, how we make you feel in relation to do we make you laugh? Are we funny? Number two, sex. In other words, all you want and what all men are good for is their dicks. And let's be honest, well, not everyone is endowed. And so today you can substitute a, a man for some much more better machine or equipment. And number three is his wallet. Does he make me laugh? Does he actually satisfy me in bed? And can he pay for my bills? That's all you're good for men today. And in, in, in the developed West, I know in, in Great Britain, the primacy is the first. Does he make me laugh? The more goofy you are, um, the more interesting you are. As a matter of fact, it's something I left out from the interaction that I had with the girls and, and the gay guy. We went to a pub and we played a game. You know, as we talked, we said, let's play a game. And I realized that the, I said, okay, well, let me, What's the game about? You know, you two girls, are you, you know, 
you know, have a go. And it connected back to the whole thing about, um, I guess, being a, being a clown, to be quite honest, let me put it that way. Um, playing all those games where it's, and it's perfectly okay for women to play such a game. Um, but I, I genuinely could not believe that I was being asked to play this game in, in public, uh, in a pub. Um, not that the game wasn't funny, but it was the, it was the inherent uh, idea behind it, which was um, the race to the bottom. This is what makes us happy. This is what makes us laugh. Um, this game is such whereby, you're, you, to an observer, it looks interesting. But the un underlying uh, message, uh, I felt, um, you know, what if we had men on the beaches of Normandy who are all jokers and who are all comedians? Do you realize actually that one of the, the greatest threats we have in society today is that we have men today who do not have the character or the characteristics of men from ancient past. We have men today who, who are more interested in being liked than actually standing up for what is supposed to be right. Uh, we care more, and I've seen this along a lot of young boys, which goes back to the sessions I did previously about being indifferent towards sex and being indifferent towards women. And staying focused on your goals, your dreams, becoming your best self, developing your career, and creating wealth. Men today are so hell-bent on pleasing a woman that they will do any and everything, even if it requires denigrating the male image. Now let me perhaps uh, connect this to why this has been a challenge for me. Um, and let me talk about my father. Uh, every woman I have met, whether it was a casual relationship um, or something that was more significant, my casual I'm saying, at least I spent more time than one with you, will tell you how much I adored and still adore my father. Any of those women will tell you that they've heard me say this a few times. That if I turn out to be half the man my father is, I would be a great father. Not a good father, a great father. Half the man my father is, I would be a great father. They will tell you that I have, and I speak so highly of my father, uh, primarily because I saw what it really meant to be a man. And I was raised by a very, very unique man. Someone who was kind, gentle, caring, loving, but also someone who had uh, integrity and character and who stood for something. Someone who could tell the truth, even when it was inconvenient to tell the truth. Uh, someone who recognized what it meant to be, to be uh, uh, the sacrificial lamb for the success of his children. So I have a very strong feelings about manhood and what it means to have a good male image. Now I recognize that a lot of young men today were not raised with their fathers. And so um, anything goes as long as mom is happy. You know, you've heard the saying before, if mama is happy, everyone is happy. If mama is not happy, nobody is happy. Um, the last 60 years we've had an assault on the male image um, to the point where today and here is perhaps another task for you an assignment mother's day is coming irrespective of where you are in the world mother's day is coming soon i can bet you if you turn on the television if you open up the newspapers you will start to see ideas of how to celebrate mothers the things you should do, the flowers you should buy, the gifts that are deserved and that mothers should get. 
And this happens sometimes six weeks in advance of Mother's Day. I can promise you one thing, Father's Day will come. And almost no one will mention. That is how much the traditional family has been destroyed and the male image. Now, what does this mean? Now, many years ago, I came across a man who um, was not my father, but someone who I respected very much. His name was Peter J. Daniels. He was an Australian uh, businessman. Uh, perhaps, in my opinion, one of the greatest speakers, uh, orators, and one of the greatest um, uh, philanthropists. And a genuinely kind man. Um, he embodied all the qualities my father had. Kind, gentle, and Peter was exceptionally good at telling jokes. But Peter had empires in his mind. Um, Australians know who Peter J. Daniels is. One of the very few early billionaires back in the day. Uh, one of the things I took out from my encounter with him and studying his life was he said something that I, I set as a goal. And he said by the time he had reached about 35, he had read about 10,000 biographies. Now that got my attention. I've always been into personal development, but I said, whoa, now I've read a lot of books, but 10,000 books is a lot. And I had 10 years ahead of me. And I said, well, let's see if I can get to that goal. The goal was not the important thing. The important thing was what and who I would become, in the words of Jim Rohn, in pursuit of the goal. Now, in this particular case, I started to read biographies and autobiographies and books, and there was something that stood out for me, and this is why I have a lot of reverence for men. A lot of the books and biographies I read were about men who had failed and who had succeeded against all odds. And so that gave me um, uh, a window of opportunity to um, confront in my limitations as a man and being comfortable with uh, the reality that I, I would fall short of my potential, not by design, but because the potential of every man is infinite. And unfortunately, um, you run out of sand before you get to your potential. Um, but most importantly, I read so many books that showed me how the role and the function of a man in a family, in a society, is not to be liked. The role of a man is to do whatever it takes to keep those who are coming behind him and those who are standing with him on the right path towards whatever future they consider to be the right future. That is your role as a man. Now, maybe um, you've been blessed to have a father. And many people have not been blessed to have known the love of a father. Um, but irrespective of what category you find yourself in, or perhaps, just perhaps, um, there is still room for improvement. And so in my closing message today, I would say that one of the things you and I have to do is to restore your self image back to what it should be as a man, um, as a male role model. It won't be easy. And the reason is simply because society frowns upon anything that looks and breeds like a man. Um, anything you say today as a man is, is put into a number of um, categories, misogynist, sexist, um, and all the litany of names. Men are not allowed to express themselves today, and so it's hard. However, it was not supposed to be easy. And I'll leave you with the following uh, words. 
If it's easy for you, then do it easy. If it's hard, in your case, then do it hard. Easy or hard, just get it done. And who knows, maybe perhaps, you know, like my father, like some of the role models, Jim Rohn, Peter J. J. Daniels, and a few other men who have been instrumental in, in creating an image of what a man should be and who a man should aspire to be and how to pick yourself up even when you fall down. Maybe um, by setting yourself straight and um, not looking to the heavens to curse the heavens, not looking to the past, not even looking towards the feminist movement, uh, but to look in the mirror at yourself and say, you know, what areas of my life uh, could I improve? And how could I be an inspiration for the generation behind me? Now, if you can do that, um, whether you're funny, whether you're a comedian, uh, whether you can tell jokes, will be irrelevant. You will be remembered for your integrity, your character, how hardworking you were, your vision, the love you had, you being present. And I think all of that alone um, in today's society is a rarity.